Last time we covered the first Mauser, a single shot black powder behemoth. But could it make the jump to the age of the repeating rifle? Hi, I'm Othias, and this ooh, is in frame now. There we go. This is the German Infantry Gewehr 7184. This is a magazine Mauser rifle. Let's get it over to the light box. With an overall length just under 51 inches, it's a little bit shorter than its predecessor, but weighs in just over 10 pounds. Woof. Now that is before you load eight 11 millimeter cartridges into its tubular magazine, one at a time. Now we've had two previous early Mauser episodes, and we've also talked about the Gewehr 98 way early in the series, and it, like this gun's gonna come up a lot. And I did say that I was gonna try to avoid having the all Mauser channel for a while. Uh, unfortunately, plans don't always go the way we make them. Now, some things have arrived, that we're going to get to very soon, but little setbacks, little fixes, taking care of things that have maybe been out of service for a hundred years. Well, that comes first. You wouldn't want us to accidentally damage anything or ourselves. So instead we're gonna fall back on the original plan, which is, oh boy, more Mausers. Now, if you're disappointed by that, I don't think you should be watching this channel. Go away. All right, for the rest of you, let's do a quick recap of what we've learned so far. We started at the beginning with the Mauser 1871, Germany's first center fire metallic cartridge rifle, except Bavaria. Then we went on to discuss the Jaeger Buxa and Carabiner versions of the same. Although that carbine wasn't really a World War I era gun, we just snuck it in because we had it handy. As part of the history, we met the brothers Mauser, who had invented an action suitable to use as a breech loading conversion, but worked into a whole rifle with a mess of features. They showed it around with the help of one Samuel Norris, who tried to market it especially to the French and Germans, but gave up on the design a little bit prematurely. The brothers, however, kept trying and did manage to get German adoption, and they were underpaid for their efforts and silence through the secrecy around the gun. But they did get a contract to make sights for their own guns, and then use that to build their own small factory, then they bought the factory they grew up working in, and boom, we have Mauser Obendorf, who received a contract to produce a limited number of their own rifles for the German government, whole rifles. Well, we're not even at this gun yet. So number one thing I wanna point out, because this is gonna come up time and again, the Mausers had to go into debt they had to sell portions of their growing company to banks in order to keep growing, all right? That's important. These are men who did not have anything to start with. They're coming from the ground up, from poverty up. They have no assets to throw at this. That is gonna leave them vulnerable as we'll see later on. It also leaves them vulnerable right now because with debts to pay at an even rate, I mean, they gotta pay on the month, right? They gotta have money coming in the month so that they can keep their employees on hand and ready to go and also pay down the bank and reclaim more and more of their own company. That'd be really nice, right? Well, the problem is Germany, like we said, declared the 71 a secret. And so it gets tricky to try to market that internationally and they didn't get paid a ton for it. So they really hammered on the ability to finally release this gun and they got it, all right? So about the time that they're able to start marketing the gun, someone else enters the field to actually be a potential buyer. This is an emergent nation, a nation that has existed but has now found its identity once more and has cast off the Ottomans. This is Serbia. Now, Serbian independence, that took decades of uprisings. But ultimately, the matter was best resolved by the Russo-Turkish War. Following this conflict, Serbian independence was finally recognized by the Ottoman Empire and the rest of the world. But they weren't allowed to date Bosnia. Rough. So that drops us off in 1878. And I don't want to go into too much detail here because sadly, this is one rifle that has eluded us throughout the whole production of the series. The original Serbian Mauser. Known as the 1878-80 or the just plain 1880, this gun incorporated a number of improvements that were provided by both the Mausers and one Serbian major, Konstantin Koka Milovanovic. Production would begin in 1881, and about 100,000 were ordered. 
Now, the Mauser Coca, as it's often called, didn't just keep the doors open at Ovendorf. It was also a significant evolution of the 1871. Again, I don't have one here, but let's just list off some of the changes that came before our gun today. The cocking piece was redesigned, allowing the mass of the cocking piece to aid in striking down on that primer. I'll show you that in a moment. An ejector was added, that's kind of handy. The vertical blade was gone from that firing pin, the one I showed you last time. It's now tapered, it no longer hangs things up. The out of battery lock was now handled by an extended raised channel in the rear of the receiver, in which an extension on the cocking piece rides. This looks a lot like that Italian Vetterli 87 modification. And speaking of Italy, the Carcano would not be the first military progressive rifling rifle. You know, sometimes it's really hard to avoid being redundant on this show, but anyway. Uh, progressive rifling again is gain twist rifling. The rifling spiral gets tighter the further you go down the barrel. It helps ease erosion at the throat of the barrel. We talked about this in our Carcano episode. Well, the Serbian 1880, it had progressive rifling long before the 18... 91. That's 11 years if I can do math good. So, uh, just a curious gun and one that's really eluded us. So if you happen to have one, I would love to talk about it in this show. It's, it's sort of the missing link in all of this discussion. Regardless, keep in mind all these features because this is what Mauser had going on in his sort of realm, just as the Germans wax off, were thinking about, well, maybe we want a repeating rifle. You see, they had reformed a rifle commission in 1877 to debate on the merits of what they wanted to do about having a single shot rifle versus some of the things that were, they were starting to see coming slowly into the military market, these darned magic repeating rifles. And again, this is not a period where we're learning something from the Russo-Turkish War. Blah, 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 plevna. One of the earlier examples of an adopted repeating rifle would be the French Navy's 1878 Kropacek. Also, if you have one of these, speak up soon because we're talking about its cousin just around the corner. Now, if there's anything we know, it's that Germany cannot tolerate France getting ahead of them on anything. And so once the French Navy had a repeating rifle, Germany was going, ah, whoa, whoa, whoa. If the army follows, we're going to be up against those things. Are they actually advantageous? I mean, do we, do we want them? Uh, we probably want them. Uh, and by the way, the Kropacek would have been, it had been offered to the Serbians and they had passed on it. And we see this a number of times. Repeating rifles are on the market. People are just wary about them because the value isn't proven yet. But Germany is leaning towards, eh, we don't like it when the French do something. So they have to think about adopting a magazine rifle. And in doing that, they have to face the classic dilemma that we've seen before, especially when we talked in our Mosin episode. They have to make one of two choices. One, they can adopt a magazine conversion system for the existing rifle. Or two, they can adopt a whole new rifle. We have seen this dilemma before, so I don't want to beat it to death, but basically, if you can convert the existing gun, you save money. If you adopt a new one, you save on faults. And we already know that Germany has aware of some problems with the 71 that they'd really like to address, especially in terms of light strikes with the firing pin and a little bit of an accuracy issue that may not be completely emergent just yet. Um, so, there's some real value to thinking about, uh, are we gonna waste all the time refurbishing a gun that has some inherent problems, or should we just go ahead and spend the cash on a brand new system, go all out? And that allows you, by the way, to do things like new cartridges or new whatever else that you need, not that you have to go that far. Well, I don't want you to think that they didn't strongly consider just the conversion program, because, they experimented with it. As a matter of fact, there's a fantastic video by Ian out there in which he's playing with what is essentially a capsule magazine conversion for the 71. I highly recommend taking a look at that thing. It is cool. Instead of saving money, the Germans went for broke. They actually went for a new rifle system. It's very similar to the old one that helps with training, but these parts are not interchangeable with the 71. Uh, and in doing so, they had to look for which kind of magazine they wanted. They really leaned into the Kropacek and the Schulhoff. Although I should say that the Winchester elevator system, as applied in the Vetterli, would have also been a curious point. Now, I don't want to give the impression that this is a committee rifle, because Mauser made the decision to go with the Kropacek-style magazine on his rifle, and the German government liked it, all right? 
If he had gone with the Schulhoff system, maybe they would have liked that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much back and forth there was in this situation. We do know that Mauser did experiment with different magazine systems. So it may be that the Germans found more favor with the tubular magazine. I certainly think it's a much more elegant solution than what other things were available at that time. Although as we'll see, there's better answers than this out there, that's for sure. But this is where they land. They land on a Mauser with a Kropacek style magazine. And that's the direction we're gonna go. Turning back to the brothers Mauser, they were kept busy from the adoption of the 1871 and into the manufacture of the Serbian contracts. Wilhelm especially had put in a lot of travel. In the course of their work, Paul, however, had been focused down on adapting their design into a repeater, and his patents were out as early as 1881. Technical drawings of this repeater appeared in the French Revue d'Artillerie in 1882. So, not a rock solid secret on this one. Overall, it's the Serbian styled gun. The firing pin is round and tapered and has a reduced rear diameter to allow the cocking piece to add mass to the strike. Also, an ejector was fitted. And again, this is all mated to a modified Kropacek style magazine. This gun would be shown to the German government and the Kaiser himself in September of 1881. On the occasion, he would also award both the brothers high honors, but this would be the last for one of them. In failing health, Wilhelm Mauser would pass away in January of 1882. And that, more than anything else, is why we always hear the name of Paul Mauser instead of Wilhelm. Now, they had worked together very well up until his death, as far as I understand it. There would be, interestingly, many years later, uh, some descendants arguing about these things. Uh, certainly his son versus, you know, Paul Mauser's nephew versus Paul Mauser in the courts on certain opinions. But realistically, everything I've read said that Paul shared the credit with his brother, that the they're working together, they're selling together, they're talking about design changes together. Yes, one might have been a bit more of a tool room guy, one might have been a little bit more of a communicator, doesn't matter. They shared their credit, they shared their cash. And so it's interesting to know that if it weren't for this death, we'd always think about Paul Mauser as part of a team, a team of two brothers. And instead, he becomes this sort of sole inventor that we know today because of all the things that come after this first repeater. Because this is the last project that they worked on together. <sighs> it's good news though that the model-ish 1881, the early version, well, that thing was ordered to the tune of 2000 for trials, so they did like the design. Now, these were very secretive trials, and I have not turned up any information on how they were run or what opinions were given, other than uh, a sort of side note that came through because, again, the Kaiser had visited, and so therefore, in writing about the Kaiser, they noted that they were very impressed with the volume of fire that was able to come from these experimental rifles. Well, that's very good, but I want you guys at home to be aware of one thing when we're talking about these early repeaters. Uh, rate of fire is not really affected by having a magazine. It is for a small slice, but not over the entire army. Let me explain that. If I single load and fire this gun, or if I load the whole tube one by one and then fire it until empty, well, both are about the same overall fire rate especially when averaged over several lines of infantry. No, the advantage here is that you have an available burst of rapid fire for the right moment, say an unexpected enemy at your flank or breaching your wall or a cavalry charge. Still, that could be a very important advantage. I mean, sometimes seconds count and that's when you have the magazine in reserve. Now, the gun did well in trials, obviously, because the Germans went forward with it. Now they did have a couple requested changes. Now from the drawings we see from the early 1881, eh, this ain't that gun. Uh, most notably, sort of the big thing that sticks out even visibly on the outside of the gun is that they did not opt for that Serbian style uh, raceway to retain the out of battery rotation. Instead, the ejector was extended rearward, thus forming a bar to fit over the raised lug on the cocking piece, preventing rotation. Now this also would serve as part of the magazine system, but we'll get there a little bit later. Now the changes wouldn't just come to the rifle. Uh, they also had to modify the ammunition a bit, and I'm kind of getting ahead because the ammunition changes 
came about as the rifle was being, you know, trialed slash produced and then on into production of the rifle, but I just feel like it covers pretty well right now. Uh, you see, during their trials process and during the early issue of the rifle, they ran into the same problems that the Russians did. They were getting chain detonations in the tube magazine. That is because when we load in a tube magazine, we put you know, bullet tip to primer cup, bullet tip to primer cup, and if you uh, shake that thing up like a good game of Scrabble, well, every once in a while you get a nice cook off. Uh, I know a lot of people say that it's not a real risk, and we've actually talked about how it never really occurs with certain models. Well, a lot of that has to do with the way you design the ammunition. And the ammunition for the 11 millimeter single shot, uh, it was not set up to avoid this particular problem yet. You see, the original 71 cartridge had a shallow, primer cup and a round nosed bullet. Right away they set that primer deeper in. This was done by the time the rifle was adopted. The next year after, that bullet tip would be flattened and these two measures seem to have solved the issue. Production of the new ammo, however, would take a couple of years. They were busy consuming the already produced 11 millimeter and I guess consuming some rifles with it. There would be a few other minor changes, but for the most part, uh, we've covered the good stuff. Now I'll show you the details in the shakedown in just a moment. Instead, let's just say that in January of 1884, we get this, the Infantry Gewehr 7184. And there's something curious about that name. In testing, it had been known as the Infantry Repeater Gewehr C82, but in the name of secrecy, the repeater part was dropped. And because they adopted in 1884, the 82 went up two doodles. It would not be acknowledged publicly as a repeater until as late as 1886 though. Again, all this secrecy for a gun mostly defined in a French commercial publication all the way back in 1882. Oh, curious side note, uh, the magazine tube was a bit of a technical challenge in terms of production, but they actually borrowed technology that had been developed by Danzig in order to make the sort of bodies, shafts of lances in order to do this with a cold drawing process. So that's just kind of a cool tidbit. But anyway, we now have this gun. And so you know what part of the show this is. This is the part where we take a closer look. So let's zoom on in. Hey, big rifle. So all the way at the rear, no sling swivel, straight wrist. There's our sling swivel up on the trigger guard. A little reinforcement down here, but obviously no magazine because it's a tube run underneath the entire length of this. There's our front sling swivel. Side mounted bayonet log, more on those in a moment. Uh, the attachment is still pretty firm like the old gun. And then boom, we have our cap for the magazine tube and a stacking rod. They have not gone with a clearing rod or a cleaning rod. This is a pull through rifle only. And then, oh, I'm gonna wander all the way back down here. We've got our rear sight, which is now an unjacketed ladder, although it works mostly the same. We have a couple positions. There's our flat sight, and then we can flip this guy up at the rear to get a couple hundred extra meters, or we can dial it in on the long range. All right, manufacturers will be found here. More on that in a moment. And oh, here's the business end. Now, most of this should look pretty familiar from the Mauser 71, so I'm not gonna go into huge detail on the bolt right away, although I wanna show you some differences in just a moment. Instead, let's look at this magazine. So there is our elevator and a follower is down in here. I'm not sure that I can really, there you guys go, down in there. Uh, so you would load your rounds down into this, and I'm sorry I don't have 11 millimeter dummies, but you would pack them in there, and then when you were ready, you would pop this bolt back. That tips this guy up. You can throw another one on the elevator or you could pick up the one that you left down in it and then that'll feed into the action. Now when I feed forward, that's gonna lower the elevator and we'll see this in the animation more clearly. That's gonna pick up the next round. Uh, if you want to use the magazine cutoff located over here, you have to do it with the elevator up, the bolt back. Now you can throw the switch. It doesn't work in any other position. So bolt forward, elevator down, ain't happening. Uh, bolt back, elevator down ain't happening. So it's not a super flexible thing. It can only be used at this one point. Now, uh, since I want to take this bolt out, I'm gonna go ahead and throw this forward. That's actually pretty critical. So just remember, we've thrown our lever forward. We're gonna loosen up our screw and release that round nut. So 
Screws loose, uh, do not force these, this is captive. It can only go that far out. We talked about that on the 71 update. So we'll let gravity do our work and I'll kind of use this upside down. Sorry if that's hard for you guys to see. I'm gonna pull this to the rear and it's held up by our lever. So as I'm pulling this rearward, I wanna rock this back and forward. So just back with a little click and then back forward. So tip, tip, and then boom, we're free. All right, so the gun oh, can be set aside. And we can go back to the bolt. Okay, so here's our bolt. Should look pretty familiar, just like the 71, although internally there's some big differences and we're gonna see them in a moment. And just externally, A, the shroud should look a bit different, but B, look at this combination part here. It's our ejector, elevator control, and out of battery lock all in one. At the moment, it's not preventing anything because it counts on being in the receiver to keep it from rotating. It's not, so I can do this, oh, and she'll come right apart. So this will be pretty important, but we'll see it in better detail in the animation. Uh, the bolt head should be able to rotate and come free. The extractor set in there. That all we know. Uh, although I will say, it's now much better for gas control. See how it's recessed in there? It's a pretty big improvement. Now, bolt body, right? Previously, we would put pressure down on this firing pin and rotate this guy at the rear. Uh, now we get to take the safety itself, which is on a spring and compress it inward and rotate. So no more putting weight on that firing pin unnecessarily. And I'm sorry that there's not a lot to look at, but there's a fair bit of pressure at play here and I'm trying to do it while being on camera. So I'm just rotating this rear nut slash shroud to the left. Oh. Now she is under spring tension to some degree, so you might wanna give it some pressure to ease things up as you get to the end. Not a lot though, not bearing on it like we had to do before, but just enough to sort of ease everything out so that you don't have a spring fly across your room or tear up the very ends of the thread when it releases. So just a little spring pressure on that firing pin, not the full bore push, all right? So now you can see that safety had that spring in there. Again, this is visible in the animation. Bolt body's mostly the same actually. Nuts a little different, but that's not a big deal. What we care about is actually here. So this step in the firing pin and the fact that we now have this nice tapered round front end. So I'm gonna grab the previous 71 uh, firing pin and cocking piece, bring them in for a little comparison. So already on the firing pins, this flat, which added so much surface area and so much potential snag is gone down to this nice round. And then two, <clears throat> at the rear, this is, I mean, this is uniformly round. Like the diameter here is uniform. This step right here counts for a lot. So on the early 71 cocking piece, when we fired the gun, this guy has the ability to freely slide up and down the firing pin further than the strike down. I mean, look how far forward we are on this. So that adds almost none of its mass. When this impacted this cocking piece didn't add its mass to that impact. It was the impact of the spring and the firing pin's weight and that was it. On this guy, we actually have, and let me get that safety out of the way, we actually have no ability to go past that mark and that mark is ahead of it actually coming down the firing pin. So that means that that mass gets added to our strike. That really helps with our clear firing, no more light strike issue. All right, I'm waving a bunch of parts around. Uh, sometimes it's hard to see how they interact. So let's go ahead and get over to the animation. All right, let's get this tube loader filled up. Of course, that's going to be one round at a time. So it takes a while. Once the magazine is full, watch this lever. We'll pop the bolt back and lock it into a single shot operation. In order to use our magazine, we'll switch that lever back and bolt forward empty to feed the next round. We then have to cycle again in order to load it into the chamber. From the left side, we can see how the ejector extension controls the elevator, tipping it up and down with the stroke of the bolt.
Notice that we have to drop the bolt all the way into battery before it will free the next cartridge. This prevents double feed. The safety is just like others we've seen. Turning it moves a half cylinder of metal into the path of the caulking piece, locking it rearward. From here, I think you've got it. So let's just sit back and relax. And with things wrapping up, we can get this over to May for a demonstration. I am not gonna lie, most tube loaders give us some form of trouble. This one did not. I rather enjoyed it on the range. I wish the ammo wasn't so hard to get. Now, uh, this gun was secret stuff to the Germans, even though everybody already knew about it, but they cared a lot about the secret, so they kept it very hush-hush. As a matter of fact, they had to camouflage the funding uh, and play merry with the books to make sure that nobody picked up on the fact that they were now going to start assembling like a million guns. Uh, this, by the way, would really get rolling in say August of 1885. That's when things start kind of pushing out the assembly lines. They would be produced at the big three German arsenals, Spandau, Danzig, and Erfurt, plus Mauser at Obendorf. 
Amberg would also trail behind the rest by about a year. The machine tooling was provided by an emerging power, Ludwig Lova, who will be important later. Again, Germany wanted total rearmament as quickly as possible, and so they pushed their arsenals hard with day and night production shifts into 1887, which is the same year that most of the contracts started wrapping up. This would leave Mauser Obendorf available for a rifle I'll be happy to cover very soon. Total production of 7184 is a bit of an estimation, but it hits right around 1 million. On average, it cost the German government about 55 marks a pop, which is dang handy because this time Paul Mauser made a deal for licensed production and apparently took home three marks for the first 100,000 rifles and one mark after that. This would keep the Obendorf factory paying back the banks, although as we'll see, apparently not enough. Oh, and those guns did come with bayonets, which would actually way outlive their hosts. The SG-7184 would be reworked time and again into World War II. There would be, by the way, a Jaeger version of this rifle as well. At first they considered doing some custom rear sight with minor changes, but ultimately they just went with the same universal sight. The 7184 Jaeger ultimately just ended up being a different rear sling swivel set into the buttstock instead of the trigger guard. A carving form was considered, but there wasn't enough time to get one off the ground as we'll soon see. Whew, okay, detail work out of the way. As these were issued in order to keep the secret going, they were given to the same four infantry regiments that had been involved in the testing of the 82, and they were sort of said, look, it's another trial. Not really, these are your guns now. So again, more German attempts to really not let on as to what they had. And it's kind of funny because again, these guns really started pushing out in late 1885 and they really got rolling in the middle of 1886. That's when you start to really see them turning up. Uh, we know that within the year, well, France is about to unleash their own secret and it's a much bigger secret. Yeah, they were adopting the first smokeless cartridge along with their LaBelle repeating rifle. I mean, the 7184 isn't just a little outclassed by this. The 8mm LaBelle cartridge is an incredible leap in terms of range, let alone not giving away your position as easily and not fouling up the gun with powder. Ooh, okay, so Germany would have to immediately spin up. I mean, think about it, they just got this done. They're patting themselves on the back and they have to spin up a smokeless powder magazine rifle program from scratch. I mean, they gotta go. Oh man, that's gotta be really disappointing. I mean, they went the extra mile. They didn't just modify the 71, they spent the money to make this. And it's done for. I mean, by the time it's really getting the troops' hands, pff, done, it's, it's useless. So here's where they're stuck too. They can't just stop because they don't know when they're gonna be able to wrap their new smokeless rifle. And in the meantime, they don't wanna have black powder single shot guns up against French smokeless repeaters. So they keep cranking away. Like they're desperate to get the 7184 out. In the meantime, they're also trying to get it out. They want to get another gun entirely. <sighs> All right, well, the funny thing is because we're not in chronological order, we've actually talked about what replaced this gun. The Gewehr 1888, a mix of ideas, both good and bad, developed without Paul Mauser or any real open trials process, complete secrecy, and assembled by committee, it was middling in many ways. And as we'll see, it will inspire Mauser to show them all how to really design a military rifle. So that means service life for the 7184 is exceptionally short. And that might be for the best because if it had lasted, this may have been not the most fondly remembered rifle. Uh, there were a number of manufacturing problems and performance problems with this gun out the gate because a couple things. One, we talked about this in the 71. The weather changes and so does your point of impact. Same is true and worse in this gun. Again, it's fixed a little too sternly at the front. The barrel as it expands has nowhere to really go. That drives off the precision. Uh, two, they had to change the way they treated the stocks because in the first batches, uh, they would swell up with any kind of moisture or weather change and boom, change the point of impact. So they had to do a lot of extra steps to sort of pre-soak these stocks so that they knew exactly where they're going to be in the service, in those temperatures. You see where I'm going with this? It gets really difficult to keep a tube magazine and a thin stock really sort of lined in. Uh, you can have a tube magazine, 
might need a thicker stock and a lot better drying and treatment procedure for the stock itself because temperature, moisture, that's gonna affect this thing. Above and beyond just the fact that you could now drop it and it's gonna take a pretty hard impact to that stock. It's gonna be very easily damaged compared to the old single shot. Uh, and then sort of some limits on the ammo. There's some concerns about the powder maybe changing with temperature and moisture. That's also potentially a thing that would change, but I think it should drop off more than it should change direction. But hey, there's, there's whole people that study ballistics for this. Uh, one of the big killers though, is the fact that this action is inherently biased to one side because it has only one locking surface. Yep, it locks on that guide lug that serves as the root of the bolt handle, which is strong enough for the cartridge, but does not evenly support that compression caused by firing. And over time, this uneven distribution will drive precision even further out. Now, Paul Mauser would solve that problem uh, with the addition of another locking lug, but that again is a rifle for next time, not this one. The Germans didn't pick up that option because it came about the time that the LaBelle dropped and they were busy chasing a whole other secret rifle and they weren't really letting Mauser in on that. Uh, that's a whole other story. <sighs> so again, this gun, not a lot of opportunity to shine because Germany isn't really fighting any wars between 1884 and well, let's say 1890 when the Gewehr uh, 88 starts rolling out. Although, one thing is, the German Navy did not adopt the 1888 and instead they stuck with the 7184, which is why you would see this particular gun in combat in the Boxer Rebellion. This was a pro-nationalist movement in China where a bunch of martial artists, i.e. boxers, decided to toss out the ever encroaching foreigners. The response, well, it was a multinational smackdown and nearly every European power, plus the Americans, decided to show up for the fight. This included the German Navy and Marine forces, who again, were still trucking around with the 7184. Even though the Gewehr 1898 had already released, just hadn't settled quite into their hands yet. Now, one of the most notable roles of the German Marines were serving under the Seymour Expedition, a failed British-led drive to Beijing. Unfortunately for the Germans, they were about the only Europeans with black powder weapons in that campaign. And on at least one occasion, when the multinational firefight commenced, the Chinese opponents would return fire directly at the German plumes of giant white smoke, ignoring the rest. Well, I'm sure the others appreciated it. There was one advantage of the 7184 in the Boxer Rebellion though. The Chinese were making use of the old 1871s and some 84s as well. And that means local ammo and parts on hand. Uh, this photo is neat, but it's actually from 1915. And that is about it for this gun because after that, well, the Navy got Gewehr 98 and here's the thing, you're Germany. You have Mauser 71 single shots. Everybody understands those, and they have the same flag safety and bolt action as the 88 and the 98. Like, it's similar enough, okay? You have Gewehr 88s that you can use as sort of second line rifles, and you have the Mauser 98 all over the place. That's good. You guys know that gun. This one ends up being a weird stepchild because, yes, it's a magazine rifle, so therefore probably better than the 71. But the magazine is wacky. I mean, you saw it. You have to know to have it back and flip this then and don't, you know, and if you don't know that, you might force it and break it. That was a common problem. Like people not understanding when to do what on this gun and damaging it. Well, it's not worth supporting. It's, you'd rather just, you have some black powder ammo, use it up on the single shots. What do they need a magazine for anyway if they're using the black powder stuff? So these guys got sold off to exporters and friendly nations very quickly. Lots went to China. Lots went on the commercial market. Not many stayed in Germany. By 1906, they were completely repra replaced all the way through the Landwehr and everyone else. Nothing, nothing to be done with this. Now the Navy technically held on to theirs in reserve, more on that in a moment, but this thing's done for, okay? It's gone, it's sort of the forgotten son of Germany. War were declared.
<laughs> you guys know the routine. Anything and everything was dug out for the war. And like with the 71, well, we saw buyback programs and uh, rearsling, and we saw, you know, playing with the trigger guards. We saw all sorts of, none of that, no. This thing, they bought a few thousand that they could get off the exporters that were still in Germany. Uh, they got them out of the reserves where they were still possible. Uh, a few had sort of squirreled their way into the colonies, very, very few. Uh, there's not a lot. I mean, these things are actually kind of hard to find photos of in the war, and it's doubtful that they ever saw frontline action. And when they were used as guard rifles, I don't know that you necessarily would have bothered loading the magazine, because it really was gone. But there were some exceptions. It was the official rifle of the Seawehr, a naval variant of the Landwehr. Basically, three years active naval service, four years in reserve, and five in the Seawehr. These were not really combat troops, and I'd be very curious to hear of any shots fired in anger. Although if you did, chances are it was a 7184. And there you have it. This is another one of those Remington rolling block scenarios. And we've talked about guns that were available in fewer numbers and freed up fewer guns to the front. It served a role. Like, wherever this was, something more useful was where it belonged, where it could be serviceable. So I give it that much credit. Now, I don't like doing all the reserve rifles that never even went to Europe, but this was there, so it squeaks in. And it's also very important to Mauser developmental history because the truth is this is not a bad rifle. It's just a rifle that existed in a very small period of time. Imagine if smokeless gunpowder had taken another 10 years to find, 20 years to find. This would have been a top of the line rifle for quite a while. The only real thing that sat in front of it was that it hadn't gone down to a small bore black powder cartridge. Not yet anyway, we have another episode. So outside of that, for a very brief period, this was truly advanced and truly top of the line. And it was a good chance to stick it to the French. It just didn't last. And so not so much the gun or the designer or the country or anybody's particular failure. It's just that technology jumped twice in a row from single shot to magazine to smoke was so fast that everybody was put off. And Germany really took a hit. I mean, this is a big financial cost to invest in all of this. It's a hit that the French mostly managed to avoid. They got to leap from single shot to repeating smokeless. So, sorry Germany, this one was a lose for you, but I still like this rifle. And I know a lot of you have handled them because there's so many in the collector's market in excellent condition because they were put out of combat so early. They're nice, they're beautiful collectors, they're beautiful handling guns. They're for a time that never existed more than a few years. And I still love it. So I'm glad I shared it with you today, but let's go get May's opinion on actually handling this thing. All right, once more, we've made room for May, and we still have just enough room for this gun. Although, if any of you happen to be in the Charleston area and have an old church you don't need anymore, Maybe it's time for the biggest ceiling we could possibly get before we start covering things like jingles or something. All right, so let me give you that. That's the first repeating round, repeating rifle for Germany. Uh, and we need your opinion coming off of the 71, the Jaeger books, uh, and the carbine. Let's drop the last two. Let's go with the long rifle versus this. How are we feeling about the ergonomics of the 7184? Not super great about it, but Here's why. So here, here, down here, right here, like all, all of this is very similar to the 71, okay? But there are some big differences. So the gun is slightly shorter than the 71. I mean, that's nice. That should take away some of the weight. Wrong. It does not. There's actually more weight to this gun. And right now, nothing loaded. That's not bad, but it's also not the best. It's just okay but then adding more rounds to it, your hand is very slowly gonna scooch forward on this guy, and you're gonna notice it as you're going through rounds. It, it, this weight really does, well, weigh on you as you're going on through it. It, it can, be, can be quite exhausting. Um, but yeah, I, I don't wanna get into, I guess just the, the firing, the, the rapid fire of this guy just yet. Um, I wanna get into that in a separate section, but the action, Manipulating it, it is very smooth, but you have to be very deliberate with the action in order to, to have it function properly. So that is something we're gonna to get to in a second, but I just wanna make sure I pointed that out. Um, flag CP, simple to operate. Um, not a huge fan of the sling swivel. 
being this far forward, it's kind of weird. Um, and then the comb, the comb is all right for the height. Like it, it puts you where you need to be for the site in my opinion. But yeah, ergonomics wise, not my favorite. And with this action, things can get a little slow on the battlefield. I can tell that she's distracted by the weight because we didn't hear the one complaint that I thought we would. Do you might maybe want to notice the one thing that you yell about for every one of these old firearms like this? Maybe where your middle finger is right now? No, I'm good. No. No, but yeah, really, there is no uh, semi-pistol grip. That is true. Like, I, I'm sorry, I say it for everyone. I feel like at this point, it's kind of weird to keep talking about it. They want to know. Yeah, okay, yeah, y'all want to know. That's true, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's true, there is no semi-pistol grip on this. I think that, like, that's just... I'm sorry, it's not that hard. Hey, it's a, you know, it's a muzzle-heavy gun. And on a muzzle-heavy gun, you really want to be able to bring that in. I think, anyway. I mean, yeah. It certainly stood out to me. But, hey, I guess for once they snuck one by you. <laughs> All right, so, you said you want to talk about the magazine separately, and I can understand that. Because, recall, you are a German soldier. This is the first magazine rifle that they are issuing. And it's a huge jump. You used to open a rifle, put cartridge in rifle, close rifle, fire. There's no carrying the one. The, there's one, the bullet, it, well, the cartridge goes all the way in. That's it, that's all you're keeping track of, one at a time. Now, you gotta load eight, and then seal it up, and then put one in, put one in, and then open up, all well, that I mean, stuff. At least I'm like with the 71, I'm no longer in the single shot range, but yeah, I'm having to deal with that tube magazine. Right. That's gonna weigh on you. So you get a burst of fire, but there's a lot to keep, this is math now, I mean, you're, Yes, we all had public education at this point, and you know, we're sitting here 100 years later. I mathed very well, thank you. And I don't want to sit there and be like, oh, everybody 100 years ago was dumb, but this is a lot under fire to keep track of. So, walk us through this magazine a little bit more exactly so that they understand where the sort of the faults are with this new system. So, here we are in this place where, hooray, we've got a tube magazine, we've got the ability to carry more rounds. Should be great. With this gun, it does require some very specific settings for where the action is in order to manipulate this magazine cutoff. So it would be very convenient if the gun was sealed up, action closed, in order for me to just manipulate the magazine cutoff. No, you have to have the bolt all the way far back, elevator up, you have to actually have that setting in order to push the magazine cutoff forward. And then at that point, well, now it's forward. That means obviously it's it's gonna the elevator is gonna stay rise. It's not gonna feed up the next round automatically. So I'd have to throw in like a Lucy or something like that, and then just single load it from here on out. Okay, let's say I'm ready for the magazine to function. Let's say I'm ready for the elevator to do its job and stop being lazy. Now this command is given as an emergency. Something on the battlefield has happened. Like yes, we are. There's a change. It's not necessarily just the command for the magazine. I mean, you might get lucky in that there's a breakthrough right in front of you, but chances are this is being told to you because we need to adapt now, okay? You're in whatever position. Your, your gun might be closed and you're about to fire. Your bolt might be back with the, this elevator would still be up, okay? You don't know where you are in the cycle, but something's happened and it's time to switch to magazine. Now, now let's normally, just say worst case scenario, I'm, I'm, I'm sealed. Like, I'm, I'm sealed, I've just fired my last round, but I'm still sealed when I'm given the order. Spent case in there. Spent case, yes, okay. spent case in here. Now, by the way, the good officer, the good officer, and everybody in rhythm should be knowing where you are in the cycle so that he can tell you when to make this magazine change, and he's gotta judge it again. But as we know, in chaos, uh, okay, so go ahead. But yeah, so at this point, I'm sealed, there's an empty casing in here, there's like two ways I can do this, but basically, like I said before, I can't, I can't take this magazine cut off. I can't put it off. Like it's, it's got to be in this position as it is until I pop the bolt all the way back. Now I can thumb it back. Okay, now you've got two decisions here. Either one, you can choose to throw in it like a single and then just fire on from there, or two, you can just choose to close the bolt empty open it back up, and then now you've got a cartridge that's fed from the follower, popped into the elevator, popped it up, and you can then decide to bolt forward and have your live round in the barrel. 
that's a lot of steps. That's a lot of extra steps that you have to decide there. And when you're on the battlefield, I'm imagining you don't really have the luxury of time, especially in the situation in which you have the urgency where you've just been given the order that, guys, things are happening, get rocking and rolling, take those magazine cutoffs off. That, to have to like decide in that instant moment, oh God, there's people coming at me and make your decision. That's, that's a bit much. I, I really feel like this is overly complicated for what it is. I'd agree. And I know we're going to get a lot of comments on Drill. And if you like Drill and you like sort of understanding where this comes from from the top, it's not German, but British Muzzle Loaders is a friend. He talks about these sort of things a lot. It's very good to understand that, yes, an officer generally is supposed to make this decision. Good luck being heard by the time you've got other problems. And then also, even if you are heard, if the operation is complex or has to be just so, if somebody futzes with it and then has to play catch up, which happens, I mean, who hasn't been to like uh, exercise or yoga or some other class and not been like, oh, I missed a step and now I got to play catch up. Or let's say I handle the action very gingerly and I don't actually cause the elevator to pop up. That can happen, guys. Yeah, any little problem and you got to play catch up. Well, now the operations for you to catch up to the rhythm are not as simple as close, bolt, flip lever, pop open and you're ready to roll. And the reason we're playing this out just in this kind of detail is because this is sort of the first of the, the German experience for this. Other guns are going to try to avoid this exact problem. So that's kind of why we're overworking it. Okay, so we talked about handling. We talked about loading in the magazine a little bit, maybe too much. Let's talk about actually shooting the gun. You get behind it, you get behind the sights, you pull the trigger. How are you doing? Line it up with the sights. Now, um, the other ones did have a, a, a sleeve over the top of it. I really didn't feel like that was necessary, but I will say that sight did seem more robust than this one. This one actually seems very delicate. Like, I really feel like even just me manipulate, I don't even manipulate it now, I still feel like I would somehow break it. I, I feel like I don't really want to mess with these sights too much, which is good. Usually I'm not having to shoot over that long of a distance, so hey, I can just get it ready and hopefully not have to fire over like 200 yards or something like that. Um, but yeah, the sights aren't bad. They're pretty straightforward. Um, action, like I said, be very deliberate with it. Um, then firing, there is a significant amount of recoil with this one because it is a very large mass that is coming out of this gun. That bullet is massive. So there is a significant amount of recoil with it that doesn't quite match up with the gun and then add the weight of those rounds that you're carrying in there, there's a lot coming back into your shoulder. So the heavier this guy is, the worse off it's gonna be for you. Trust me on that one. I did have to fire this one several times so that we can get the right takes for it. But hey, you know what? For shooting, it did function very well the whole time. We didn't really have any problems with any, th any misfires or anything like that. It, it did work very well. Um, but yeah, other than that, Shooting wise, it was fun. I enjoyed it, but the problem is we're in black powder. Ah, that's again, that's like waving a flag above my head. I can't really hide with this guy. Now, for anybody concerned about the mask comment, because I know we're going to get that, the heavier the rifle, the easier it is on recoil, usually. Usually. The concern here is that you have a floating mass in the stock. Somewhere, it's, so. The spring's keeping it to the rear for the most part, but when you fire it, you still get a little play in there. We debated this. I don't feel it. May feels it. There's a perception of a change in the recoil almost randomly, depending on the position of those cartridges rocking in there. Like it's just a uncontrolled sliding mass. I would say honestly, it's the difference between if you have the two fully loaded versus if you just have one or two rounds in there. I would say that's when you actually notice the difference. And it took several workings with this gun in order for me to even notice it. So it isn't really something super perceivable. I will say that you're going to have to try it out for yourself. It's certainly nowhere near as much as what you'd perceive with say like an auto five shotgun where you have no. full recoil and then a long recoil operating system where you feel that double hump. It's not that pronounced, but anyway, uh, that was just a conversation we had on the side that um, partially came out in this. Uh, number two, uh, with the black powder smoke. This was actually a concern with these guns is that if we have a bunch of people firing in line and we start using the repeating rifle with black powder because smokeless wasn't available at the time, there's this fear that we're going to smoke out of our, our own environment. We won't be able to see what we're shooting at, but we're certainly a big enough body that we can be fired into because we're in line. So 
there was some fear on repeating rifles, and there was an argument against them in many ways that they would oversmoke their own position just from the sheer volume of fire, which is why, again, you're supposed to use it as a single loader, and the uh, repeating fire is for emergencies or very specific uh, problems with almost breakthroughs or cavalry charges or things like that. And with the black powders, I think we saw, uh, as May cleared this thing, uh, with the camera, the way it was set up, uh, it's really hard to see because you're looking at her, uh, I try to show it with the high speed. I try to get backed off a little bit. Some of that cloud forming. There was a haze in the air for a good couple of minutes after we were done filming. Just one magazine. Yeah, it and does gun. not disappear. It does take a while to go away. So take a line of 20 of her doing that. And I could see it actually becoming a real problem. All right. So all of that covered. It's the Great War now. Because we're not talking about using this in 1886. We're talking about the Great War as a reserve rifle. Uh, are you going to get anywhere near the front line with something like this? No, are you kidding me? It's a black powder. It's completely unbalanced. It's it's awkward to handle, and you have to be very deliberate with your motions when manipulating the bolt on this guy. No, I'm going to give this a hard no, just because there is too much that I think would go wrong with me taking this to the front lines. Yeah, I'm a hard pass, too. And I start to think that we can see, may I borrow that? Sure. I think we're starting to see why the 71 had longer legs than the repeating version of itself. Like, this has improvements over the 71, but the stock's vulnerable with that tube magazine. It needs more, it's more parts to maintain, it's more weight, uh, it's more complexity. It's certainly not the easiest thing to use with lines of poorly trained men. Well, it's no wonder this thing didn't even really make the trip to Africa, and instead the single shot 71 stuck around for so long. This thing really got kicked off the front line early because. It's just advanced enough to be a hindrance to itself and not advanced enough to get around the real problems. And it's good though. The 7184 is a really good marker for showing us A, the evolution of the Mauser family, B, the evolution of sort of small arms technology, and C, why there was a hump to go from single shot to repeater, not just technologically, but also because there may be some distinct disadvantages to a smoke black powder repeating rifle. I mean, Probably the best example we've seen of a black powder repeater is probably the Austrian straight pull 1886. I, I would argue you can simultaneously load five rounds. So you actually do load faster. You actually speed everything up. However, again, you run into the risk of the clouds of smoke and obscuring your vision and things like that. But complexity is way down. So keep that in mind as maybe the, the ultimate repeater, whereas something like this, yes, it works and it can be good for certain situations. But yes, it works isn't always going to cut it. Yeah. No, it's still a beautiful piece. If you own one, I'd be very happy. I'd be proud to own one. Um, they're gorgeous. And to me, probably like a revolver, one of those kinesthetically pleasing guns. Um, I highly recommend somebody out there start manufacturing dummy cartridges for the people that own these because you can't feel it when you handle it empty. But with live ammo, well, not even live ammo, but with ammo in the magazine, when you rack this thing, it comes back forward and it releases the cartridge onto the elevator. That click that yeah, you can... Yeah, that, that feels real good, guys. Yeah, go watch, go back and watch the video. It's so pleasant. I'm sorry. I really get into stuff like that where I can feel the mechanism working under my fingers. That is super cool. It's like the click of a revolver. It's just nice. Not really helpful in the battlefield, but it's fun as a collector. All right, I think that's got us covered. Uh, is there anything else, any other mentions for this gun? No, I, I honestly liked it. It was fun shooter in general. I would love to have one of my own personal collections someday, but for protection of my own life, not going to bet on it, no. No. All right, well, thank you for tuning in. Stay after the credits for updates, and we'll see you next time. Hey gang, update is that we just got back from a trip to visit another local gun channel, Iraq Veteran 8888. Now, uh, as part of that, we did borrow an MG08 sled to take with our borrowed MG08, which had borrowed fittings. I'm gonna say that it took quite a bit to put this whole package together, but we got it done. And so, I can finally start working on the episode proper. The research is there, the script needs to be made, and then I have to film the indoor bits. You guys know how this goes, so it'll be a couple weeks, but 
as I said, that gun does free up, finally, all of this backlog of machine guns. So, you'll start seeing more of these peppering the stack. Alright, thank you once again to all of our viewers, and especially our patrons, because there's no way we could get all of that horror show over with without your financial support.